I was waving at you. Oh, we're on. Okay, sorry. I'm sitting here talking, and somebody uh, around the world in Malaysia is going, what's that guy doing? So, I am glad you're here today. Glad you've come to worship. Good to see you. We started today Sunday school. We hadn't done that in, um, well, 10 months, okay, that we've not been back, and, and uh, I was real pleased. We, had, we were talking. I had no idea who would show up, how many we'd have here. Uh, but we had 22 adults, so we had six youth, five children, and I think five back in the nursery. So I'm counting, I think Lorraine was here practicing, so that counts 39. You're, you're, you're general officer now, so <laughs> we're going to count. Everybody's in this building. Like that. But, but glad you came. If you came out today, I'm, I think probably almost everybody was here. So glad you came, glad you were a part of that, uh, um, again, knowing uh, hiding God's word in our heart. Uh, we were talking about that the goal is not Sunday school. The goal is not Sunday school. The goal is God's word, that to, to know God through his word. Let's put it that way. And so uh, glad you were here, glad you were um, part of that. Tonight we have our uh, uh, men's Bible study on the, the gospel of Matthew. Uh, continue. We're not? No choir. Okay, sorry, Jerry. I was being correct. No choir tonight, but but we are having a men's Bible study. I know it's Super Bowl Sunday, and but you ought to be. Somebody showed me a text that said you ought to be as excited about uh, church as you are the Super Bowl, at least more so. And Debbie said, matter of fact, we have a good service. They're going to dump Gatorade on my head. So <laughs> at the end of the service. So, <laughs> but um, so anyways. But I'm glad you're here. W- women's Bible study tomorrow night at six thirty. Um, uh, again, plan on on. Um, being there for that. Uh, Wednesday night, uh, we started a new series. Uh, I'm leading that. I had Rick and Amy with me Sunday night. We, we answered the question, what does it mean to be human? And uh, we started with that question, looking biblically, and we're going to talk about just the systematic theology, going through the basics of our faith. I uh, encourage you, if you want to come sit here in the auditorium and listen to that, we may even find a way to make you a part of it if you want to be and ask questions, but we'll have to figure that out. But I uh, encourage you to tune in uh, again as we, we look at that, and, and uh, we'll, we'll be probably pulling some more of you in to have some of those discussions as we go through uh, that time together. A couple of other things just real quick. Uh, Valentine's back. I know those are going out. You sell that fundraiser for our youth and children. As they, you know, We're going to do camps this summer. We're going to try to take our kids to camp, both youth and uh, children's camp, and uh, uh, we, we've, we've never not let a kid go because they couldn't afford it. And so we're, we're looking at some fundraise to fundraise and have that idea of those, those Valentine bags. And so I think the, this, what day was the end day? The next Friday? Friday is the last day for Valentine's bags if you want to do those. Uh, got a new fundraiser coming up with that. Our coin collection is um, uh, going to Grace Ministries this month. Uh, one other thing with that, I think next month, uh, we've been mentioned, and Linda had talked about uh, her granddaughter, Grace, is going on a mission trip to uh, Nicaragua uh, this summer and has to raise some money. So our next month, probably in March, we will put Grace on there, and we'll help Grace raise some money uh, to do that. And we've done that at different times for different people, and what an opportunity for this young sophomore in high school to be able to go, and we'll just pray that God continue that. Uh, she mentioned prayer requests. A couple of them, uh, Lee's in uh, her, um, uh, John is her grandson-in-law is in uh, at, uh, MD Anderson getting evaluated. We'll know tomorrow about how things are going. Plus, Marvin Herg's mom is in surgery right now. So those are some things, some issues that we have that are concerned about. So, again, glad you're here today. Let's join the, together. Stand with me as we join together in prayer as we begin this time of worship today. Father, we thank you um, for calling us here today. But before you even called us here today, you called us to be your children. Um, Father, the word says that, that um, you knew us, you formed us. And uh, long before we were ever a thought, Father, you knew who we were. Father, you knew about this day. You knew that we would come together. And, and um, Father... You knew about Jan Lee Baptist Church. Um, Father, we come to glorify you today, to worship you. We come to bow before you and acknowledge you as God. You're our creator. You sustain us, Father, with just your common grace. You saved us in your saving grace. And, and Father, we follow you in 
as Lord and we get to know you as Father and call you Father and, and Lord we desire to know you as friend Father be with us today as we come to worship Father let us bow before you and give you glory and we pray this in the name of Jesus Amen Be filled with the Spirit speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he, living he loved me, dying he saved. for the ungodly. on my 
So we'll live. Amen. God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to Because he lives. 
Dear most gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful that we can start our week here in your house and in your presence, God. I pray that you'd fill this place with the Holy Spirit. Help us to hear your words, Lord, and help us to write them onto our hearts, that we might be able to share them with this world that so desperately needs to hear from you. I pray that you'd be with Pastor Mark as he brings us the message, Lord. Give him the words you'd have him to speak, and help us to understand and discern them properly. And I pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. deacon pastor uniforms today we actually didn't even call each other we just <laughs> he walked down and went, hey I like what you're wearing Jonah chapter 1 verse 17 through 210 says this it says but the Lord provided a great fish to swallow Jonah and Jonah was inside the fish three days and three nights from inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord, his God, and said, In my distress, I called to the Lord, and he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called for help. You listened to my cry. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas, and the current swirled about me. All your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. The earth beneath barred me, barred me in forever. But you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, 
and you and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace God that God could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What have what I have vowed I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. And here's the capstone. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Joseph onto dry land. <laughs> amen and amen. You come to this passage, and how would you like to have the name? You know, I don't know. Have you ever had a nickname before? I had a nickname, my nephew. We won't talk about that today. But I have a nickname that uh, followed me through college, and because some of the friends from high school went to college with me. But how would you, somebody walk around and see Jonah and say, hey, there's OFV. FV, yeah, fish vomit. <laughs> How would you like to be known as fish vomit? This is what Jonah led to when you come to that place of coming to a, to a low spot in life before you can start back up. You come to a place in knowing that all through the scriptures, and you see Jonah in this story, every place, if you go back and read the first chapter, he keeps going down. God called him, and what? He went down to Joppa. He went down into the boat. He went down into the hold of the boat. Finally, he went down into the depths of the sea. He kept just sinking lower and lower, and he had to get to that place where nothing was left before he could go back up. So he comes to this place, and again, what we find here, we're, we're talking about a spirit, serious spiritual retreat and the severe mercy of God. Uh, one must go down before they can get back up. Now, uh, that was pretty severe for Jonah. When we talk about the severe mercy of God, what are we talking about? Has anybody ever been someplace where uh, you, you paid a price for something, but in the end you look back on it and think, boy, I needed that lesson. I needed that lesson. I needed... To, to have that happen to me. I, I, one of my favorite stories of mine was, was as a second grader. I was in second grade. And I had, there had been some kind of class election, and I had won the election. And I remember walking out to recess and turning around to the kid I beat going, ha, ha, ha. And I turned around and walked smack dab into a wall and almost knocked myself out. God said, quit that bragging. <laughs> quit that bragging. I, that was a life lesson learned, but we talk about the severe nature of God. We don't know who exactly said this. It gets attributed to Mother Teresa. Maybe she said it. Maybe she was just quoting someone else. But you will never realize Jesus is all you need until what? Jesus is all that you have. That's where Jonah was. That's where Jonah was in his life. In this moment in time, he was totally reliant on Jesus. I've been to a spiritual retreat. Or anybody been to a spiritual retreat before and, and had gone away and had, I, I had somebody pray for, for me to go to a walk to a mass. Uh, went to that. It was a great weekend, Thursday night through Sunday afternoon. Uh, they made you take away your cell phones. You didn't have anything. It was all spiritual. There was lots of feeding. I, very restful, uh, spiritually uplifting time. But you know what? The food was good too. I wasn't in a retreat like Jonah was because Jonah had to come to a place of suffering to get God, to get, for God to get him to where he needed to be. Well, we look at this, and I asked the question several years ago. I was asking myself, reading a book, Philip Yancey's, I don't remember if it was what, what uh, the Jesus I never knew or, or what's so amazing about grace. I don't remember which book it came out of. But he asked, he challenged uh, us to, to just... Simply say, why you're a Christian in 20 words or less. If you were on an elevator with somebody and said, hey, why are you a Christian? Could you tell them in that moment, that elevator, why you're a Christian? That was the challenge. And, and so I worked at that. I, this is not something I just came with. It's something I thought about. But my answer to that is that I desperately need God and I desperately need grace. And Jesus is the only one who offers and provides both. He's the only one that provides both of those. And so, so we come to that place and, and, and find that out. So, again, we go back to our story today. 
Jonah, we know, comes there. He's down. He's come to that place. And uh, the only way that, that the people's lives are going to be saved, if Jonah repents, Jonah jumps into the sea or the sailors throw him into the sea. They throw him into the sea. That's because that's what Jonah says. You have to do this. I'm not going to jump my own. I'm not going to repent. So if you're going to save your lives, you're going to have to throw me into the ocean. And in a great peril to themselves, a great uh, personal angst, they chose to do that. They threw him in. And then remember we talked last week about the conversion of these pagan Gentile sailors. And I think that the proof of that is they didn't worship God in the middle of the storm. They worshiped him where? After the sea became calm. Now, I don't know when this fish swallows Jonah. We don't know. Well, it might have been a situation where, and we don't know what kind of fish it was. I read a story today just preparing for this about uh, during the whaling years, during the, the American whaling years, there was a story of a, of a sailor who, uh, one of those on board a ship of a whaling ship, and they were out, and the ship was knocked overboard, and a, and a sperm whale swallowed this man whole. In about 1871, he, he came and was swallowed by a sperm well. Uh, a couple of days later, this well was caught and killed and hauled on board. And when they cut it open, this sailor fell out alive. So to say that this story couldn't have just happened, it could. I, I think the miraculous part of the story was the fact that God, the timing of what happened, and brings him to a place of Jonah being there. Now, Jonah knows when he goes into the water what purpose he's going in there for, right? He's going in there. He knows I'm going into water to die. Now, I, don't, I wouldn't want to drown. I wouldn't want to choose that as the way I die. But let me tell you, it's a lot quicker than being digested by a fish. And so when Jonah gets swallowed by this whale or this great fish or whatever it was, that swallowed him, I don't know, I don't know if he knew that in three days he was getting out. I don't know if it would come to his mind yet whether he was certain uh, in three days, I'm going to spend three days here and then I'm going to be fish vomit and, and get up and, and do that. I don't know if that's the case. All he knows is he's been swallowed by a fish. He's saved from drowning in the moment. But now he's being digested. Now the sailors on board ship, we don't know. Did, did he get swallowed in the midst of the storm? Or maybe it was one of those things where the storm calmed down. They see Jonah still in the water. Hey, maybe he can get back on the boat. And all of a sudden they watch a big fish come and swallow him whole. That would even be more terrifying. But what we know is he comes to that place and he's conscious inside the belly of this animal and he begins to pray you see we talked about the pagan sailors and, and verifying their faith by worshiping in the calm versus just in the storm but now sometimes we as believers don't we need a storm in our life unfortunately to bring us to a place of worship sometimes we need God to remind us of who he is in our relationship with him and the cost of the relationship to bring us into that place. And that's exactly what Jonah needed. We come in and we find this of moving God's grace from the abstract to the concrete. There are several things that Jonah prays in here when we look at this. And you, you look at this in the end, at the end, he talks about uh, down in uh, verse 8, he said, To those who cling to worthless idols, they forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with the song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. He discovers God's grace again. We know by scriptures that what? We are saved by grace, right? The unmerited, unearned favor of God. We are saved by that grace. That's what saves us. We access that grace by how? By faith. We access it by faith, but, but again, it is the grace of God. And when we look at other ways of, of trying to come to God, when we look at ways of good works or philosophy or ignore it, whatever, the Bible says, Jonah says, we forfeit the grace that God offers. We give it up. But grace understands that, that those who are in Christ, and 
again, go back to that why I'm a Christian. Because I've learned I can't do it. I can't do it. I've tried to, to, to be good. Anybody tried to be good before? How, how did that work out for you? Doesn't work out well. I want to be good. I, I desire to be good, but I know that it requires the grace of God to get me there. So, so, but one of the problems when we find this in our lives, I think it was a problem in Jonah's life, and I think it's a problem in our lives. So often grace becomes abstract versus concrete in our lives. What does it mean to be abstract? Well, it's just a concept. Grace is a concept. Why well, understand grace? It's the unmerited favor of God. But have we experienced the grace of God? Has it been part of our, our life experience that we've recognized, we've seen, I have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death, and there is no hope for me apart from God, and so we move it into that place, and we cry out to God, God, save me. And we experience God's grace in the concrete. What we find here is this. Again, just what I was saying. Just as Jonah cried out, I'm sinful and separated in God without hope. I am sinful and separated God and without hope. That, that idea that we come to that place, Jesus, I think, put it this way in the Sermon on the Mount. He said this. Jesus calls it spiritual poverty. In the Sermon on the Mount, you remember that when Jesus is, is working, and just as we get into our, uh, our evening men's and women's Bible studies, we're going to spend a couple of weeks on the Sermon on the Mount, just two weeks. Boy, we could spend a lot of time there, but he begins that with the Beatitudes. In that first one, when he calls his disciples, he says, Blessed are the what? The poor in spirit. The word that they use here, this poor in spirit, that idea of spiritual poverty, that the Greeks had two different words for, for poor. There was a poor that meant uh, not rich, okay? It, it, it just you weren't rich. You, you, you had that kind. But then there was another poor, a word they used that meant destitute. Unless somebody intervened in that person's life, they were going to die and die in their poverty and starve to death. And, and, and that was the word that was Jesus used here. It was a spiritual poverty that we come and recognize apart from God, there is no hope for me. There's no hope. But I think it also means this. Moving from the abstract to the concrete, I'm spiritually impotent and unable to save myself. Jonah, come to this place with Jonah. Think about him for a minute. Okay, he's been thrown into the ocean, um, out in the middle of some place. He's too far to swim any place yeah. in. He can't swim. He can't make it. The storm's raging around him. Uh, whether the storm calms and he has a maybe a second of hope before this animal swallows him. But he has that second. And then when he gets swallowed by this animal, he comes up and there's no way out. There's nothing he can do. He's completely and totally trapped. He's at the mercy of this animal and, in a sense, the mercy of God. And so he, he, he is unable to do anything about this. He, he can't, there's no place to turn. And what we find here, again, this is called, I think, in the Sermon on the Mount, spiritual mourning. Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, who grieve over the sin, their sins and the sins of the world. What we find, if we go back and we look at, uh, we were talking Wednesday night about being created in the image of God. We were trying to get to that place, and Amy was kept wanting to get into that place. Let's go to the next step. That Yeah, we're created in the image of God, and there's all these great things, but something's wrong. Something's broken. Something's not right. And we look at that and, and look around and we see, no, it's not right. And it shouldn't make us angry. It ought to cause us to grieve. Why? Because we're part of the problem. They say G.K. Chesterton, the, 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 the British journalist, Christian journalist, uh, there was a, uh, somebody wrote in the a newspaper, wrote uh, a column, and they were asking what's wrong with the world. 
Chesterton wrote in, and he wrote a, a letter back to the letter to the editor, and he simply wrote this: "What's wrong with the world? I am. I am. That's what's wrong with the world. You know, we like to look out and we like to see and we like to point fingers and all the things that are wrong with the world. But until we come to that place and we say, I'm what's wrong with the world. Until I get right. And we come to that place and we mourn and we grieve over that because we can't save ourselves. There's no hope. The last thing we find here is moving God's grace from the abstract to the concrete is God has paid a great price to rescue me. And I turn to him and it's my only hope. This is the part that we miss sometimes. You know, so often we come in, and, and uh, have you ever shared the gospel with somebody and come to a place? I've heard this more than once. When you ask the question, you come in and say, have you come to a place that you know for certain you have eternal life and that you die, you're going to heaven? And sometimes I hear, yes, I know that. And then you ask the follow-up question, but if you were standing before God right now, I would ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? Often the answer is, well, I'm a good person. I'm a good person. Well, there's a problem with that. One of my favorite parables of Jesus is him telling the, the Pharisee, the, the religious guy, and the tax collector. And he said they both go up to the temple to pray, right? And, and the, 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 tax, the, the religious guy, the Pharisee, goes up and he prays something like this. He says, God, thank you. God, you're so lucky to have me. You are so fortunate to have someone like me in your corner. I give all this stuff to you, and I do all this for you, and Lord, you ought to be blessed because of the way I bless you. And thank you I'm not like that tax collector, that sinner over there. And then Jesus said there was another one. There was a the, the you know the most hated one of the if you've not watched the chosen yet please watch this the first few episodes with Matthew the tax collector great 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 way they depict that he's a weirdo <laughs> he's great it's, but he says this tax collector goes up and he said he won't, he stands afar won't even look to heaven and beats his breast and says God have mercy on me a sinner and says Jesus comes and says that one that one is the one that comes away exalted, not the other. So when you say, I'm a good person, all you're saying is, God, you're lucky to have me. You're lucky to have somebody like me because I'm good. And Jesus says, no, you're not. You're broken and you're a sinner and you need my grace. You need my grace. We turn to him and, and this is the part looking at this. You know, we, we talk a lot about free stuff now. People want free stuff. But it costs somebody something. It costs somebody something. Our salvation is a free gift. Matter of fact, it goes back, and we use that passage that, that all of sin to come short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's free. It's free to us. But somebody paid for it. Somebody paid for it. And, and that's the case. It was God who paid for it. And he paid for it with the life of his son. Did the blood, we sing about the blood of Jesus today. There's power in the blood. Well, th that has meaning in that, that sense that Christ shed his blood for us so we can have hope. And when we come in and, and we put grace in the abstract, we kind of blow that off. When we put it into the concrete, we recognize what a costly, costly thing this was. This is called spiritual weakness. This is what Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount, I think it comes to that place. You know that word, people don't like that word meek. I was listening to a motivational speaker once, and he was talking about meek, and he was making fun of this. And he said, well, he don't, Jesus didn't live in this world, but if you're meek out there, you're going to be run over and... And he just had a total misunderstanding of even what the word means. Because it's this idea, it's not weakness. 
but it is one that we come to a place and we, we, we become pliable, bendable. We become under control. We're under God's control. It could, it could be used, the word that they would use for that would be a horse that allowed a bit to be put in the mouth. It would be a meek horse. It was under control. It was teachable. It was pliable. It was, there were things there that, that, that could be a part of that. And so when we come to that, we, again, we, we recognize that, that, again, that God paid the price to rescue us, and we submit to that. And this is where Jonah is in his life. He comes to that place where he recognizes, my only hope is God, and I submit to that. And it brings himself to a place of what? Repentance. Remember, he's already confessed. You go back into chapter 1. He, remember we talked about that last week. He confessed his sin. I'm the cause of this. But now he repents and he says, again, I, with the song of thanksgiving, I'll sacrifice to you. He, under the Old Testament system, he recognizes, he looks toward the temple. He thinks about the place of worship where God is, is represented, where God is at. He, he confesses, I'm going to give thanks. I'm going to sacrifice and what I have vowed, I will make good. And he recognizes that salvation only comes from the Lord. You'll never appreciate God's grace until you've been in the belly of the fish. Now, I don't want to be in the belly of the fish. I don't want to experience that. I don't want to experience the possibility of drowning. And let me tell you what, you come to this place of, I think what Jesus is saying, you don't have to get to that point at the last straw before you get there. You can go there willfully. You can go there willfully. I'm going to come and I'm going to, I don't, you know, I've, I've learned in my younger days, there were, I had to learn lessons the hard way. In my younger days, I had to learn lessons the hard way. I, 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 you know, sometimes it was, you know, I, that, that was painful. I don't want to do that again. As I get older, I'm like, boy, let's just learn the easy way, Lord. I, I, just, I, don't, I, don't, I don't want to experience that pain and that anguish that goes with that. I want to learn now just from your word and watching and seeing and being obedient to what you call me to do. I asked the question today, why are, you, why, are, why are you here this morning? This time, this place, with these people participating in this movie? Ask that question. Why? I mean, if somebody asks you what goes on here, if somebody wasn't familiar, and the most basic explanation we give them, well, we show up and we sing some songs together, and then we hear this nice man tell a story about the Bible. And then we go home and eat lunch, right? I mean, that's pretty. That's the truth, right? But is that all it is? Do we come here today and enter into the belly of the well? Do we come here today and enter into the belly of the well and recognize, God, you're my only hope? You know, I, I, I believe everybody here, I, I, I don't know, I think almost everybody here is profess faith in Jesus. You've been saved. You've been born again. But I think there's an element of our worship when we come out on this first day of the week that we re-experience, we relive what God has done for us. That's what worship is. It's not getting saved again. We haven't somehow in the, during the week lost our salvation and done something. It's just coming in, though, and, and, and doing that. When we take the Lord's Supper, what are we doing? We're recalling the cost, the price that, that it was to bring us right with God. We come to worship and bow down and say, God, without you, there's no hope. There's no hope for this world. There's no hope for me. There's no hope for my church apart from you. And, and I come and I give you thanks and I sacrifice. And the sacrifice now is not the blood of an animal, but what? A living sacrifice that we make to God. Romans 12, 1 and 2. A living sacrifice. I give myself to you. And I'm going to 
live up to what you've called me to be and to do. We enter that belly of the well. In Tim Keller's book, last paragraph of the chapter dealing with this, it says, God releases Jonah from the fish, even though his repentance is only partial. Our merciful God patiently works with us, flawed and clueless though we are. You know, this is why we repeat this process weekly. Right? Why it's not a one and done situation. Because you know what? We are flawed and we're clueless. And when we come and we experience worship, what? We take another step forward. You're going to find, Jonah, how flawed this repentance is when we get into the next part of this. Because there's some repentance that takes place, and he goes, but you know what? He still hates the Ninevites. And he hates what God does for them. So his repentance is partial. But we come and we meet on this place at this time, at this place, to again enter into the belly of the well that we might repent and believe and take a step forward to be released into the world. You'll never realize Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. Huh. So we come to worship today. We come to worship. Simple as that. We come to that place of bowing before God and saying, look, I'm broken and I messed up. You don't have to look at other people because you know, other people are broken and messed up, right? But where do we start? We start here. And simply coming in. Some of you need to do that for the first time. Some of you need to do that for the first time. You need to acknowledge, I am broken and messed up. And I need God because he's the only one that can save me. He's the only one that can make a difference and turn to him and allow his grace to overflow you and then, yes, vomit you back up onto dry land so you can go do. You ever thought about leaving church? Blah. <laughs> okay, get out there and get busy this week. <laughs> Wherever you're at, maybe you've been a believer for 20, 30 years, you come to a place today and say, you go back to the beginning. God, I want to remember, I want to recall, and I want to worship you for it. Maybe you're on the other end of the spectrum. Maybe you've not come to that place yet that you need that relationship with Jesus. And today's the day to say, yes, Jesus. Yes, Jesus. I recognize who you are, what you've done, and what you've done for me. And yes, I confess and repent and believe in you. Maybe today's the day you do that. Let's pray. Father, we come today and... I, I prayed this morning, Lord, I, I don't know what to do with this for sure. I just to confess how inadequate I feel um, week after week, trying to divide your word and to bring it in some clarity and... and but, Lord, just rely on you. To rely on you to, to do something with my offering. Because it's not me. It's not about me. It's about who you are and what you want to do for us. To rescue us. To bring us on the right ground. To to. Again, to, to put us back onto the shore and to, to let us move forward and do what you've called us to do. Father, I pray that there's some people here today I know that, that need to come to that place of brokenness. 
They need to get in the belly of the well and have an encounter with you. And you allow them to spit them back up into the world that they can go and live for you and, and honor the vow, honor to what you, you've called them to be and do, to grow. Lord, I pray that today. If, if Give courage through the Holy Spirit, Father, to someone who needs to move. And what we're asking them to do today, Lord, if, if that's that place, they need to come to that place of, of coming into that relationship that you move them, either voice to, to the person they're sitting next to, I need Jesus. Simply say, I need Jesus. Or they do with, with me up here, whatever the case, but we move forward. We move forward in our relationship. All of us here today need to go back and recall and remember, Jesus, what you've done for us, the price you paid, to express gratitude, to confess, to repent, to move forward. Again, Lord, we love you. And Father, we sing today in your honor. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand with me as we sing today. Amen. Amen. I'm reading a book right now, or actually listened on Audible, but boy, that's loud. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, and it, it just deals with, it, it's called Tactics, and it's dealing with, with sharing our faith. And, and the guy, the author of the book, one of the things he said, he says, you know, often he said, we always try to get to that place of the, and we, we want that. We want to lead people to Christ. But he said, sometimes I've learned I just need to put a stone in a person's shoe. I just need to put a stone in a person's shoe. That that, wait a minute, something's. If nothing else today, if you're here without Christ, that that at least I put a stone in your shoe today. The gospel put a stone in your shoe today. 
But then let me tell you, you, you know, we all come again to renew that place. We sing that song today. That song today is just a renewal again. I, if, if, you, if you sing that song with meaning, you worship today. Gary and I have had that conversation. We've talked about different times, but I wonder, if, you know, how people felt about that particular service. And said, who knows from week to week who, who worships? You know, you can come here and attend, and you can sit, and you can sing, and you can listen to the sermon and not worship. Because worship is coming to that place of bowing before God and saying, you're God and I'm not, and I need you. I'm hopeless without you. That's where worship takes place. And again, we come weekly to renew that relationship and commitment to God. So again, bless you. Bless you. Oh, wait. I have a business. <laughs> Please be seated just for a moment.